Okay, hello everyone, welcome. Um, my name is Chris Harkins, and here with me is fellow GPHS graduate student Thomas Ott. And today we have the pleasure of welcoming a special guest to our colloquium series, Jeff McDonnell. Today, Dr. McDonnell will be giving a presentation and sharing with us a talk on the subject of watershed and isotope hydrology. Dr. Jeff McDonnell has been a professor of hydrology and associate director of the Global Institute for Water Security at the University of Saskatchewan since 2012. His work focuses on new ways to measure, understand, and model streamflow generation processes, and he is currently president of the AGU Hydrology Section and a visiting distinguished professor at Tsinghua University. We are excited to have him with us today, so please join us in welcoming to the stage Dr. Jeff McDonald. Well, thanks very much, and it's, uh, it's great to be here and back in Reno. I was thinking earlier today, uh, when I was here last lecturing, and I realized it was 2005, when probably most of the students here were still in elementary school. So it's great to be back and to see what is effectively a whole new campus. Uh, there are new buildings everywhere that I didn't uh, notice back then, and it seems like things are really booming here, so that's, that's great. I've had a terrific morning talking to faculty and students, and my hope today is to give you a little bit of a, a, a discussion about the terrestrial water cycle, something that connects all of us in, in water, depending on what we're working on, and some of the issues surrounding it based on some of the work that uh, I, myself, and my uh, graduate students and postdocs have been involved with for the past many years. And it's so wonderful to have Tom Torgensen here because most of my work uh, while I was still in the U.S. prior to 2012 was funded through NSF, so I'm so appreciative of, uh, of his assistance and his predecessor's uh, assistance in terms of some of my work. This talk really is an extended version of a small commentary that uh, came out about a year ago uh, called Beyond the Water Balance, and just to uh, kind of give you the punchline of this talk before we get going, uh, the terrestrial water cycle is often assessed annually at the catchment scale, this is really the building block of how we do a, a, a water balance assessment in a catchment. But as you'll see today, water stored in the catchment is often poorly mixed and at time scales well beyond uh, the calculation of the annual water balance, meaning a lot of the individual components are, are very old indeed. And this calls into question how we then apply our accounting model, like our bank account for inputs, outputs, and change in storage. And this is what I want to uh, uh, go through with you over the next 45 minutes or so. So the outline for this talk is to give you first a bit of background on this equation and a little bit on stable isotopes as tracers, one of the tools that I'll, I'll use. And then I'd like to talk about how geology and then biology perhaps uh, exert controls on, on stream flow. And this is uh, very much related to some of the things that uh, uh, the faculty and their, their students are working on. I know Havame Ivaristo and uh, Adrian Harpold and, and several others I've talked with are interested too in these kinds of questions and I'll try to uh, touch on things that might link to some of that work. And then uh, a new look at the terrestrial water cycle. And we're gonna start off here in the Seine. You're all familiar with the Seine uh, as it flows through Paris and you sip a coffee on the left bank or the right bank. This is the headwaters of the Seine up towards Dijon and there's a spring that sustains flow there. And uh, we're gonna talk about this in the context of the background on the, the catchment water balance. So this is a, a, a book, uh, a, a scientific study, uh, dating back to 1674, based on that section of the upper Seine, uh, the, the origin of springs by Pierre Perrault. Before this time, this is really you know, only 10 years into the creation of the French Academy of Sciences, the Royal Society. It's very early on in the scientific uh, revolution, if you like. Uh, there had been a lot of speculation dating back to Greek philosophers about why streams flow when the rain stops falling. So you're in a, an arid area like we are here in, in Nevada. You know, how can streams be flowing if it hasn't rained for two or three months? And lots of uh, kind of perceptual models, if you like, of uh, Underground, um, underground oceans and uh, vast caverns under mountains with 
condensation that would allow to sustain uh, stream flow when it wasn't raining. And what Perot did, and he's really the first field hydrologist, he went out armed with some measurement techniques. So he started off walking down uh, about a 10 kilometer stretch of stream flow from the headwaters of the catchment down this section. He mapped out the catchment area. Of course, this is before topographic maps or really any uh, things we'd use today to quantify the, the area. And then he measured flow in a nearby uh, rain gauge station near the town of Dijon, just uh, south of here, and then made some stream flow measurements here. And this was the first time measurements were brought to bear to, to kind of uh, reject other hypotheses about stream flow when it wasn't raining. Here's the section that he wandered down. This is the that, that small upper headwaters of the Seine. And here's the area where he made measurements. Uh, I'm taking samples for tritium analysis here, but it's a catchment that's about uh, 145 square kilometers. So a small headwater catchment. And what did he find? And why is this important? He found for the first time with measurements that there was more than enough input in the way of rainfall than there was uh, discharge measured in the stream. About six times the amount of rain fell in Dijon uh, than was needed to form the stream flow as a, a, a depth when you take into account the catchment area and turn that cubic meters per second, of course he didn't use SI units, into a, a millimeter depth of runoff. So this was quite important because this was uh, really pivotal in our science of hydrology, this study, and I don't think Pierre Perrault gets nearly enough uh, credit. But it took a long time for there to be agreement on this. Uh, and it really wasn't until Dalton in the early 1800s in England who made measurements at several uh, sites across the country, several catchments, that he said in this 1802 paper, we can fairly conclude that the rain and dew of this country are equivalent to the quantity of water carried off by evaporation and by rivers. So this is now a more complete verbal description of that catchment water balance. And what we're, what we're now left with, and what we still work with, and most of the students will have seen this textbook. Oh, my, my pointer, I think, has gone blank. But uh, it, what we see in, in textbooks like Dingman, that many of you might uh, be using, is our annual water balance. And of course, it's just change in storage with time is input minus output. Of course, the inputs are here, snow melt, as well as rainfall, and outputs are a balance of stream flow and evapotranspiration. And of course, if you're in a, a humid area or, or, a, or an arid, more arid area, the balance of stream flow and ET are, are, are quite different. But this is, the, this is really our most simple and fundamental equation. And in fact, many people have said this. This is a really important paper by Ignacio Rodriguez Iturbe. Uh, it came out in uh, early 2000. And I, I think this paper is really coincides with the birth of the field of eco-hydrology. And in this paper, he talks about the, the water balance equation here applied not to the whole catchment, but to a soil column, the change in storage with time in the soil, uh, with Z being the, uh, the depth of soil, N being the porosity, equals input minus uh, outputs, uh, both in terms of evapotranspiration and L uh, stream flow loss. And his point here was that it's beguilingly simple because uh, everything is related to that soil moisture storage state, S. So what we've done, I think, as a field, both in hydrology, eco-hydrology, and all uh, variations on the hydrology theme, is since Dalton, done just more sophisticated measurements of input and output. Now we have uh, fancy gauging stations, this one from the H.J. Andrews LTER site in Oregon, and we'll recognize that site. And we use rain gauges, maybe use a snow pillow or a snow lysimeter, and we quantify uh, this part of the, the, the equation, input minus output. So here's a scrolling animation of that. This is from a small catchment in um, southeast Alaska. It's pretty rainy, surprisingly mild. On the x-axis is day of the year. On the y-axis is the runoff and liters per second. And those hanging bar graphs, of course, are the rainfall hyetograph kind of driving all that. But when we look at these input-output relations, which we really is what hydrology is largely based on until recent uh, uh, decade or two, this is really describing the celerity of the hydraulic potentials in terms of 
uh, propagation of pressure through the landscape. What do I mean by that? I mean that this is quite analogous to uh, uh, a, a full garden hose on your parents' front lawn as you're growing up wherever that was in, in the, the US or elsewhere, and you lift up one end of the hose and what happens? Instantly, water squirts out the other end. It could be 10 meters away, the other end, but the, the, the kinematics of water movement through that hose are such that you're, if you're measuring the other end of the hose, you're, you're really measuring the, the, the hydraulics of uh, the, the, the potential moving through the hose, the pressure propagation. And this is really what we're talking about when we look at these uh, rainfall runoff hydrographs. The celerity of the hydro hydraulic potentials. Now what I want to talk about now is work over these last uh, few decades using stable isotopes has helped to kind of put this in perspective. So of course we all study or learn about the water cycle, gosh, in, in high school. I think my kids in Oregon uh, were exposed to this maybe in grade 11. And, uh, but we can also look at the isotopic composition of not only the liquid, but the vapor, particularly now with laser, uh, laser spec uh, machines that some people here are using. And in this case, we're looking at the oxygen 18 composition in per mil. These numbers represent uh, signatures that we can measure and we can now uh, look at the movement of the isotope signatures as it relates to the fluxes of water in the, this terrestrial water cycle. And if we zoom into the catchment that we've looked at already, now rather than rainfall runoff, we can look at the O18 composition or the deuterium composition. These are the, the, the two uh, isotopes of, of, of the water molecule, if you like. And we're looking here at about six or seven years of input. They vary. Uh, through the year, closer to zero in the summertime, uh, more negative in the wintertime. And then we sample the outflow of the catchment in the form of base flow, what do we see? We see a lagged and damp version. And the amount of lagging and damping really relates to the storage in the landscape. If this was a, a Walmart parking lot in Reno, then maybe the right-hand side would look identical to the left-hand side, because there's nowhere for the water to go but to run off. And if this was a very, very deep sand tank with almost infinite depth, then the right-hand side would look just like a straight line. And what we usually see is some lagging and damping like you see here. But the really important point, I think, to make is that this is really representing the velocity of the water molecule. And this contrasts greatly with the celerity of the hydraulic potentials. And it's really representing this storage change with time, something that the rainfall runoff signal is not letting us get at necessarily. So to continue to kind of push on this analogy, we've got our full garden hose. It's been heating out in your, uh, your yard in the summertime. You hook it up to the water tap and that water is cold. What happens? You turn on the water. Again, instantly water squirts out the end of the hose, but it might take several minutes for that cold water to snake its way through the hose and be felt at the other end. And that's the difference between uh, celerity and velocity that I'm trying to uh, talk about and, and make this analogy to uh, what we see in catchments. Let me show you this with data. This is from the H.J. Andrews uh, watershed. Here we've taken one of these laser specs. Again, it's simply an instrument to measure the isotope uh, composition of uh, oxygen and deuterium. So that's what we're seeing on the y-axis. This is uh, 018, this is deuterium. This is a, a rainfall runoff event covering about three days. Here's the uh, the y-axis for the red line is the runoff, and the black is the rain hyetograph. And what you're seeing is the, the stream is responding to the rainfall, and uh, the runoff ratio here would probably rival a suburban catchment in Reno. So it's a flashy place. And now if we look at what's carried with the rainfall, with the isotope composition of the rain in blue, again, my pointer stopped working, but you can see the blue line very faintly here uh, through the event. That's reflecting the uh, input characteristics associated with the rain, the intensity, the air mass trajectory, some of the subtle micro met changes that are happening. You're seeing it also for the 018. But now look at the stream in red. Stream in red is pretty flat. It's like, it's like the patient is dead here. You know, the, rain, the hydrograph's responding, but the, there's very little, if any, evidence of any rainfall in that stream, even in that flashy hydrograph. And this, I think, is a, a, a strong example of the difference 
between the celerity of hydraulic potentials represented by the hydrograph and the velocity of the water molecule. Basically, all the water that's comprising that storm hydrograph that's created by the rain is water that somehow pushed out that was in the catchment prior to the rain event. So celerity is uh, a lot faster than, than velocity. Um, this is a paper Scott Giusecco from UC Santa Barbara, a former postdoc of mine, uh, has in, in review right now, but I think it's a beautiful kind of uh, representation of how common this finding is. Maybe not as extreme as the example I showed you, but on the y-axis here he's showing groundwater or pre-event water of discharge, so going from zero to 100. So zero would be all rainfall, uh, no groundwater. 100% would be all groundwater, no evidence of rainfall. Maybe that's like the example I gave you from the previous slide. But what's quite striking for these, these studies, he's lined up along the bottom here, just look at the vast preponderance of studies that support this idea that most of the water in the stream could be your uh, stream flow signal in the Truckee Basin during snowmelt. It's not this year's snowmelt, it's displacing water that was in the catchment prior to the event. And you're seeing here, look at the 50% line uh, as compared, and then beyond, in terms of beyond 75%, perhaps uh, the largest number of studies might lie. Now there's a lot of variance and a lot of, uh, depends on how you look at it at the peak of the event or you integrate over the entire event. But this is more common than we might, uh, than we might think. So now I wanna talk about how geology might affect all of this. So I've given you a bit of a background on the water balance, how isotopes can be helpful in giving us perhaps a different window into how water cycles through our catchments, how catchments store and release water. Now let's think about how the, the lower boundary might influence that. So you've seen this diagram in, on the top. Uh, we use this kind of uh, in a cartoon-like way to calculate how old the water is in the stream. So far we've just talked about is it pre-event or event? Is it rainfall or is it older than rainfall? We can try to get at how old the water is by convolving the rain input on the left with a function. And this is a, uh, what we call the transit time distribution function. So you see residence time on the, the, the x-axis here in the lower plot, a kind of a frequency diagram. And what we're doing is picking one of these one of these uh, functions could be, uh, it could be an exponential model. Oh, there we go, that you see here. It could be more of a Dirac function. It could be two parallel linear reservoirs. If you're a civil engineer, you've seen these kinds of functions. Uh, if you haven't, they just have names. And what we're doing is trying to get the best fit in our measured data with the base flow on the right-hand side. So here's an example. This is 018 on the y-axis with time. This is from one of those catchments at the H.J. Andrews. The green dots are what we've sampled. This is Kevin McGuire's PhD work from the mid-90s. And then that faint gray line is our best fit line through this convolution process. And then we simply take the mean of that uh, function. If it's an exponential, we take the mean of that transit time distribution. In this case, the mean transit time for that stream water is 2.2 years. So that's what we're saying is the average uh, maybe uh, time it takes for the water molecule to move through the catchment. So we've looked at this at a number of catchments. I wanna show you some, some sites in Oregon. Uh, we'll start off in the coast range here, that large circle on the left. Uh, these are um, catchments that are formed on kind of meta sedimentary uh, rocks. And you're seeing uh, uh, eight of these catchments, I think it is, ranging in size, these catchments from about five uh, hectares to about 100 square kilometers. And on the y-axis is the mean transit time of those stream waters, and on the x-axis is the area, the catchment area. And when you, what you see is uh, uh, transit times varying from maybe a few years to about 11 years. That's the, the age of the water, as it were. And it's, it's, it's scaling with basin area, meaning as the catchments get bigger, we seem to be seeing older and older water. If we slide over to the H.J. Um, Andrews in the... Uh, in the, in the volcanics here, near some of these peaks you'll, rep, you'll, you'll quickly identify, Mount St. Helens and, and others. The H.J. Andrews is underlain by quite tight volcanic rocks, and if we look on the left-hand plot, the relationship between mean transit time and area, there's no relationship. At the other site, this H.J. This Andrews site, it all 
it boils down to some function of flow path length, flow path gradient. So just knowing the flow path length in these catchments, if we kind of sum them up, we can explain 70% of the variance of the main transit time. If we bring in the slope length and the slope gradient together, we can explain over 90% of the variance of transit time. And the age of the water is much less, maybe one to three years, as opposed to uh, three to 11 or so years. So this has a big sponge on the left-hand side, and the right-hand side is saying there's not much sponge, and we don't have much sponge. Things are all now affected by the, the outward characteristics of the terrain, whereas the left-hand side is saying that's not the case. And that left-hand side, here's some of those uh, sedimentary uh, metamorphosed rocks, if you like. This is a big store for water. And this is really affecting then, just like that cartoon I showed earlier, the lagging and damping we see uh, in the stream. So thinking about how geology affects uh, water in streams, we've gone to one of the most beautiful natural uh, study sites, I think, in Luxembourg. This is not the whole country of Luxembourg, but you could fit many Luxembourgs in the Willamette Valley. Uh, the whole country is about 5,000 square kilometers, so it's a small place but they have amazing network of gauging stations. Here are, I think, 16 of them, and these colors represent different rock types, going from really tight um, marls and, uh, and, and schists to really permeable sandstones. And what we find is, if we look here at mean transit time on the y-axis versus the degree of uh, permeability of the rock, if you like, what we find is that, just like we saw in Oregon, strong control by bedrock permeability. The more permeable, uh, the, the longer the mean transit time, the less permeable, the shorter the mean transit time. And these, the size of these dots are simply the flow magnitude of these different, uh, these different streams. So geology seems to play a big factor in the tracer damping. But all we've really looked in terms of geology so far is catchments kind of parked on different rock types. What if we actually go into the rocks? This is some work of Scott Giusecco I had, had some minor involvement with. Uh, and we looked at 6,500 groundwater wells from around the, the world, uh, mostly in the US and Europe, but a few elsewhere. And these are wells that had carbon isotope data to do age dating of the stored water. This is now the, the actual bona fide groundwater, the water in the rocks, and at depth that uh, you know, we kind of wave our hands at as catchment hydrologists. And this finding for me as a catchment hydrologist was quite interesting. The y-axis is depth below the surface, so here we're going down 600 meters. Now we go out with our augers as grad students in hill slope hydrology, you know, we don't, we don't auger down 600 meters. Six meters if we're extremely lucky, maybe 60 centimeters on a good day. But here we're looking at uh, groundwater data and we're looking at this across a number of these sites that are just kind of listed across here. And the question is how old is this groundwater? And what we found in this kind of meta-analysis is that fossil groundwater, groundwater that we're calling, uh, or that is 10,000 years old or older, uh, comprises about two-thirds of the water pumped from wells deeper than 250 meters. Now, 250 meters is a long way to go if you think about where we make a lot of our measurements in terms of soil moisture flux and eco-hydrological uh, uh, cycling. But you think of the topographic relief in your catchments you're working in, this is not a terrific uh, distance in terms of a, the, the topographic uh, distribution that you might see in, even in a headwater catchment. So this, was, this for me was uh, quite telling in terms of how this uh, storage plays out in terms of water uh, below ground. And what it means to the water balance, I think, is that you know, we do the calculation of the water balance on an annual basis and yet we know full well that water in storage is very old. Uh, my colleague Barbara Sherwood Lawler at University of Toronto has been chronicling billion, that's with a B, year old uh, water in, um, at sites that she's been drilling in deep mines in South Africa and Ontario. And we know our stream flow can vary from, uh, can vary from months, but it can vary to years or decades. And uh, one of the colleagues I was speaking with today, we we're chatting with some uh, people we know in New Zealand who are chronicling, you know, 80 to 100 year old mean, a, or mean transit time for stream flow. How do we deal with this in the context of an annual water balance calculation? The second thing I want to talk about is the role of biology. So we've, we've looked at the lower boundary, 
What about the upper boundary? And again, we know that the, what's transpired uh, can exceed stream flow in many cases, certainly it would in this part of the world. And the big question is, uh, well, how do trees facilitate this? How do they, how does this, this kind of uh, biological boundary condition affect this, this water balance, this view of the terrestrial water balance? So the question is, what water do trees use? How old is that water? And of course, if we do look into the, the subsurface, the, these, uh, these roughness elements, as we might treat them as hydrologists, they've got a lot going on. If we hydro sluice the, uh, the, you know, the, the soil away and look what's, what's really there, this is only representing a tiny fraction of the large roots that remain after you might do that. So this is really what things look like underground. And we're, what we're going to do is sample the tree water much like we'd sample stream water. We're gonna sample the, the sap flux, the water in the xylem that's actively transporting water and wicking water out of the system. And this, think of this as analogous to sampling a stream. But these are the, the vertical streams that are getting rid of the water uh, to the atmosphere. And much of the work, I mean, prior to maybe a decade ago assumed that what water the trees were using was basically the same water that would otherwise go to groundwater recharge as it made its way past the rooting zone. It was just one happy, well-mixed reservoir, and the two, the two boundary conditions, if you like, were, were drawing on that same uh, water, as it were. So we're gonna go back to the isotope technique. You've seen this plot. But now, rather than just look at a single isotope, like we have in a plot like this, where we look at the sinusoidal input of, say, rainfall, in terms of O18, we're gonna look at the two isotopes uh, of, of water against each other in a, a dual isotope plot. And this is showing the same thing. I just want you to get your head around this plot. Uh, this is uh, deuterium on the y-axis, O18 on the, the x-axis, as we always do in a plot like this. And this linear relationship between the two isotopes is really how that uh, sine wave plays out now in dual isotope space. So you saw in this plot how uh, it was, uh, again, my pointer's not working, but, oh, there we are. If you can just see the top of that, uh, that peak and in in that kind of sine wave function, uh, and then the trough, this is showing the seasonality of that uh, input. And here we're seeing it now just expressed along this meteoric water line where up in the upper right-hand corner, that would, let's say, summer rainfall, and the bottom left-hand corner more like winter rainfall. This is from a tropical site, it's not quite that, but what I'm showing you is that this is the, the main expanse of that uh, sinusoidal input of rainfall, and just like we saw before, uh, things like soil water are a lagged and damp version of that, and stream flow is even further la lagged and damped. But now we're looking at it in dual isotope space. So this is the setup now for the next couple of slides I wanna show you, because every catchment I'd worked in prior to maybe a decade ago all the waters I sampled plotted on this meteoric water line. Anything that plots off this line is a telltale sign of some kind of fractionation. Below the line is evaporative fractionation, above the line is condensation. So if you're in a, I don't know, in a forest on, in Lanai in Hawaii, and it's raking in cloud water, and that cloud water is uh, condensing on the tree needles and dripping to the soil surface, and you went out and sampled that water with a bucket, that water would plot above the meteoric water line. If you went out to, uh, I don't know, Lake Tahoe in the middle of summer and you sampled the lake water, that lake water would probably plot below the meteoric water line because those processes um, pull water away from the line. But in our catchments, everything that I'd seen has been on that line. So back to the biology question, here we are in Oregon again at the H.J. Andrews, uh, working with a, a plant ecophysiologist, uh, Renee Brooks at EPA. Uh, one day we had a conversation over coffee as we, as we were wont to do back in the, uh, a decade ago or so. And my question to her was, so Renee, you know, all my plots, all my isotopes I've sampled from these catchments in Oregon, just like this site in Mexico, they all fell on the meteoric water line. Hey, where do your tree water samples plot? Because she'd started doing some isotope analysis of the plant water. And this is what, these are the data she brought to coffee one day, and I, I almost uh, passed a whole cup of coffee through my nose after I saw this plot, because her plant water was plotting below the meteoric water line in this space that I'd never seen any of my samples before. 
And again, I'd sample snow, uh, well, yeah, snow, rain, trench flow from a hill slope, groundwater, soil water with my suction lysimeter techniques. And this was tray bizarre because this is saying we don't know where the trees are getting their water because I sampled what I thought were all the end members the trees could possibly be using. But we, we realized that the way she samples her tree water is using a technique called cryogenic extraction. Basically, it's a way to coax all the water out of the, the tissue that she's uh, obtained from the plant xylem water. So we did a set of samples. This is also with uh, uh, Holly Barnard uh, was, was part of this work as part of her PhD work. Some of you might know Holly Barnard, who's a rotator now at NSF. Um, and we sampled the soil water, but rather than using the, the suction lysimeter technique that many hydrologists use, we did cryogenic extraction on the, on the soil water, meaning we got all the soil water out. And that's important uh, thing to note because anyone who's done work with a suction lysimeter knows you can pump and pump and pump, and by the time the soil gets to beyond about 60 inches of mercury, pardon the units, you, you, you just can't get any more water out of the soil, and yet there's still water in the soil. Cryo gets it all out. So not surprisingly then, the trees are using soil water, and their soil water is varying from very shallow, 10 centimeters, 20, 30, all the way down to about a meter. But it was strange to us even then, because here's a photo of the site. It's a wet site. It's a, it's a temperate rainforest, but it gets quite dry in the summer. It, it might go rain-free for two or three months, and this is when the trees are, um, are, are transpiring. But it's suggesting that the, the trees are using a type of soil water that we don't see in the more mobile water we'd sample with a suction lysimeter. And the mobile water seems to be hugging this meteoric water line, and the tree water seems to be falling on this kind of soil water evaporation line. More evaporated, shallow, less evaporated as you go down to depth and extinguish that evaporation uh, signal. So what this is suggesting is really we have uh, two water worlds, as it were. And this is maybe not a useful uh, terminology, but it's, it's eco-hydrological separation, maybe is more technically correct. Where on the left-hand side, this is maybe the hydrologist's view of a, a catchment where the water, the rainfall in blue is hugging that meteoric water line. It's varying uh, seasonally, stretching out along that line, and the streams are a lagged and damp version of that input. But what the trees seem to be suggesting is that they are a lagged and damp version not of the mobile water, but of this uh, soil water. And the soil water with, it seems like less mobility than the water that we get out uh, from our suction lysimeters that fall on that meteoric water line. Soil water that sticks around long enough to undergo evaporative enrichment. And of course, this was still something that uh, we had no uh, real belief in, even after the, the work we'd done in Oregon and uh, some other sites because we thought that perhaps it relates to the fact that it's such a strongly out of phase system. It's really wet in the winter, but the trees aren't really transpiring. It's bone dry in the summer when the trees are active. Maybe it has something to do with that. So, but and it's, it's a bit of a can of worms in the sense that if you're a biogeochemist, this is telling you something about maybe it's not so well, well mixed after all. If you're doing uh, isotope transit time analysis that assumes and, and uh, that the system is mixed this is suggesting that perhaps it's not so well mixed. So along comes Havame <laughs> Ivaristo, who came to do a, a PhD with me. And Havame, uh, his first paper out of it in his thesis was a, really a meta-analysis where we were seeking to reject this so-called two water worlds hypothesis. He was able to find roughly 50 studies in the literature that had all the data necessary to try to reject this hypothesis. So in other words, these were the sites that had um, had stream flow uh, isotope data, groundwater isotope data, soil water data, plant water data, and this was filled in with some other global data sets uh, Havame was able to get his, his hands on to kind of fill, fill this out. And just very simply, looking at the, this, this meta-analysis from these sites, it's showing, uh, just as we, as we would have expected, groundwater hugging the meteoric water line, stream water hugging the meteoric water line, rainfall, and snow melt right on the meteoric water line. But when he looked at the plant water and the soil water, they are trending on a shallower slope off that meteoric water line, suggesting, at least qualitatively in this plot, that 
this hydro eco hydrological separation is much more widespread than what we would have otherwise imagined. Because here, this is covering biomes from arid to semi-arid to humid to you know, higher latitude to tropical. I'm not gonna go into those details, but this was really, a, for me, an interesting finding and kind of uh, similar to other findings that were coming out right about the same time. This is Steve Good's um, postdoc work out of University of Utah. Stephen is now an assistant professor at Oregon State University. He was using um, uh, remotely sensed isotope information. So uh, something that I didn't know at the time, but I'm only now realizing is that there, this Aura satellite is able to measure uh, the deuterium composition of atmospheric vapor. And the way they kind of correct these numbers is with ships at sea that measure near surface uh, deuterium composition and they correct this, uh, this, this kind of isotope mass balance, if you like, of the, of the vapor. And what they found in this paper that came out just about the same time as Havame, maybe a little bit, a couple of months later, was something very similar in terms of uh, uh, connectivity constraints partition of global terrestrial water fluxes. This is a quote from the paper. Limited connectivity between soil and surface water fundamentally structures the physical and biogeochemical interactions of water transitioning through catchments. Kind of having to invoke uh, eco-hydrological separation to close their deuterium water balances now measured in a kind of a global sense with this remote sensing technique. The last thing I'll show you then is, is really getting at the question of, well, we've talked about transpired water. We've said that it's different to the more mobile water we see in the stream or groundwater, but we've not said how old it is. Well, we were wondering how, where we could go after this question, and the Lus Plateau of China is a beautiful place to work. Here you can hand auger, maybe not down to 600 meters, but down to 20 meters. In fact, the PhD students at Northwest Ag and Forestry University, you know, regularly have competition to see who can go deepest and win the award for deepest auger. You know, I made it to 18 meters. Oh, the next student made it to 18.3 meters. And it's just like butter, because you're, you're augering through Lus, and the water table is down, gosh, 100 meters, let's say, at this site. So this is a, one of the deepest, most uniform uh, critical zones or, or, uh, that you might encounter. And what it also uh, preserves quite beautifully is the atmospheric bomb tritium signal that you would see in a rainfall uh, plot from Ottawa or Vienna or some of these long-term stations where if you take this plot and kind of turn it on its side, this would be 1963 when the, Montreal, when the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty came into effect and global tritium concentrations started to fall. That's what's being preserved here beautifully in the soil profile. So it's taken from 1963 to now to make it down to about eight meters, the peak of this uh, tritium pulse through the profile. Now, to make a long story longer, these apple trees that are being grown on the Lys Plateau as part of a afforestation effort to stabilize this, zone, this region from erosion, they are putting down roots all the way through this, down to 12, even 13 meters, and they're sampling this distribution. So again, with Havame and a PhD student named Zhang from Northwest Ag and Forestry University and Bing Si, a professor uh, at my university, uh, we did a small analysis where Havame performed an end, um, a, a Bayesian mixing model of five of these trees. And what you're seeing here are the tree numbers. And this is the distribution just with color representing the contributions to that xylem water that's really inferred by the apples. So we did some apple pressing. We looked at the apple water tritium concentration and we matched the apple water tritium concentration to that distribution of tritium below. And with Havame's Bayesian mixing model, it seemed that the distribution of uptake from those roots was pretty uniform with, with, uh, with depth. But the interesting uh, number was, going back to the title of this slide, the mean age of that water was 29 years old. So again, we think of the annual water balance from a catchment. Everything's solved in our, our uh, counting model subannually, and now we got transpired water almost 30 years old. What the heck? So this is really prompting me and, and others, and there's many other groups doing uh, different work on these, these topics, perhaps a new look at the terrestrial water cycle. And you know, rather than what we learn in high school about the 
the regular smooth rhythm of the, the cycling of water, maybe it's more compartmentalized than previously thought, especially when you think of, you know, billion-year-old groundwater that Barbara Sherwood Lawler is finding, or, you know, 30-year-old transpired water, again, another extreme, admittedly. Uh, and I think it's compartmentalized because when you look at the age of stream water, not something we can do so precisely, but we can use a proxy for that that we're calling young stream flow. It's another uh, paper by Scott Giusecco came out in 2016. If we look at catchments of the world where we have isotope data, again, a lot of them in North America and Europe, but some elsewhere as well, we're asking the question, uh, how much does young stream flow, that stream flow less than three months, uh, express itself in these streams? And what we find is that this young stream flow is about a third of global runoff. So we got all this super old water that I've been talking about that's affected by the lower boundary and upper boundary, and yet a third of global runoff is uh, less than three months old. We've got this real dichotomy between water in the stream. Now, I'm not telling you about the whole age distribution of stream flow. We don't know how to get at that yet. But it's saying that really it's just a tiny fraction of this continental aquifer volume that's generating a third of river discharge. I had Adam Ward visit a couple of weeks ago, give a seminar at Saskatchewan. He says, uh, what is stream flow? Stream, lo stream flow is simply a, a catastrophic failure of the groundwater storage system. I think that's such a great way of putting what is stream flow. But that catastrophic failure includes this, this, this di dichotomy of young and old. And I think that's a real frontier for us in, in hydrology. And maybe what it forces us to think about is a new kind of water balance and not change in storage equals input minus output uh, because the, the hydrometrics don't allow us to really get at change in storage. And we're looking at these two very different aspects of the system when we compare the isotopes uh, and the, the hydrometrics. And what I think all this work is suggesting is something that I'm working on with Wouter uh, Bauhaus at um, ETH Zurich, a postdoc with Jim, uh, with Jim Kirshner, is really uh, an age-based version of the water balance. So everything uh, where, where storage inflow and outflow are all specified with respect to their travel time, this tau here. So everything now is is in the context of its travel time, this may be a way to kind of fuse the celerity and velocity world and get, allow us to kind of think about now these storages and how they're playing out in terms of the cycling of water through our catchments, well beyond the one-year uh, accounting model that typically we would uh, we'd look at. Now, why is this important? And I'm gonna end with the one practical example. I might have started with this practical example, but I want you to now uh, maybe have your appetite whetted about what we're, what we're finding uh, with these studies. But let's, let's end with one practical example, just a couple of slides and then I promise to, to finish. Why we care about this is that these forested headwaters that I've been talking about, they are uh, probably half the drinking water here in the US and you know, they're, they're water supply for billions of people worldwide. But they are undergoing unprecedented change. Uh, this is a paper that came out in uh, Science in 2013, and this is showing uh, how change is expressing itself globally. This is forest extent in, in 2000 in green. Not much in the way of forest gain over 12 years, but here's forest loss. Look at that, those red uh, areas. And this is forest loss per year uh, globally. And most of this change is happening in the headwaters of catchments, like you saw in that photo. Now, how do we assess that change? Well, just like we have catchments in California, Nevada, there's probably 90 or more uh, paired watershed studies that have been going on in the US since, um, since uh, Wagon Wheel Gap in the late 1920s by Bates and Hendry. Some of you might know of those studies. How do we do that? We take two headwater catchments, just like the catchments I've been showing in this talk. We uh, monitor them for quite some time. We look at their hydrographs on the, just below. So I'm looking at the plot on the left-hand side. And then what do we do? We, we alter one of those catchments. We cut the trees down, we burn it, we uh, do some kind of treatment. And how do we assess treatment? We do a before-after statistical design and we compare the treated with the control. 
So the control on the right hand is B and the treatment is A. The problem with this change assessment of land use change is that when you look at the data, and this is a new meta-analysis Habame has started, and we've got a paper we're hoping to get out soon on this. This is some early version of this paper. Here are the 90 or so catchments on stringing down uh, the line here that, that he's assessed. And this is percent cut. So how much of the watershed was cut? Was it 100% clear cut or only just a little bit uh, taken off the, the landscape? And now here are the, so those open dots represent the percent cut going from zero to 100% as we look down the plot. And then these, these red arrows are showing the flow magnitude change for each of these sites. Let's just zoom in on one. This is the upper part of the plot. Here are some sites. You can't really see the names of the sites, but these are sites that have you know, minimal cut, maybe zero to 20% of the catchment's been cut. And what do we see? Some that have minimal cut have quite big uh, response. This is, uh, the response is down here, I should have mentioned. This is the odds ratio. It's good we're in Reno. This is a gambling uh, term, maybe. This is the odds of change. Uh, so, you know, zero, zero change, uh, increasing the odds of, of change. Now, let's look at the bottom part of this plot, if I can get this to work. Uh, and now we're looking at catchments that have been 100% clear cut. But now look, 100% clear cut, some, some are have very, very low odds of any change. This is the state of our science. And the point I'm trying to make is, and the point Havamay and I are trying to make in, in this and another paper, I think a lot of this comes down to the storage and the compartmentalization. And the fact that all these uh, paired watershed studies are examined in the context of a, of a water balance change on an annual basis. And this storage, particularly below ground storage, I think, could help explain the enormous variance we get. You know, you could have uh, everything from increases in flow, decreases in flow, no change in flow. That's what the last hundred years of paired watershed studies associated with land use change suggests. And I think the hitherto unrecognized portion of wh why you might see the change you see could be related to uh, below ground storage. And then also how trees are drawing from that storage or streams are drawing from that storage. All right, let me try to uh, wrap up. What am I saying? I guess I'm saying uh, celerity is much greater than velocity. Uh, and this is something maybe s since I was here last in 2005, I've really come to appreciate as I look across different catchment systems. And more recently, appreciating that the subsurface is not just poorly mixed, it's acutely non-well mixed. Uh, there seems to be widespread support for this eco-hydrological separation hypothesis, but I think we remain open to the fact that the whole thing could be rejected depending on new studies of mechanisms. And perhaps, you know, much of it boils down to perhaps fractionation associated with mycorrhizal fungi that are, f that are enabling water movement to find roots, and perhaps there's fractionation along that transport pathway. And in fact, there's one or two papers that are in review right now that are maybe suggestive of that. But it does uh, suggest all of these studies some kind of compartmentalization of a terrestrial water cycle that we've otherwise thought as a very smooth rhythmic uh, cycle. And I think, you know, one quote going back to uh, 1674, which is really a powerful one, it is to experiments that we owe the finest knowledge we now have concerning the things of nature. And I guess the thing that I've been kind of, um, I was gonna say railing against, but maybe trying to comment, comment on rationally in the literature lately is, uh, man, we, we see such a decline in field experiments as we go to uh, a very model-focused only uh, approach to our catchment systems. We need models, we need field experiments. We need models and field experiments and lab experiments to work hand in glove. But I think, you know, field experiments are kind of going the way of the dodo. And uh, it'd be interesting to talk to Tom about his perspective on that from what he funds or has funded at NSF. But certainly in Canada and Europe, I think the number of field studies, the number of experimental catchments continues to see a precipitous decline, especially in northern uh, landscapes. There have been several papers recently chronicling the decline in those observational networks. So my last slide, I guess, is wh what's the way forward? 
And maybe, you know, rather than continuing to think about the water balance as our, our holy grail, uh, and I'm not throwing the water balance baby out with the bath water. I'm talking about maybe a new look at the water balance by looking at the age of the water balance components. But I think maybe the questions going forward is, uh, how do geology and biology control the water uh, we see in the stream? How can chemistry help? I've only talked about stable isotopes. I'm a hydrologist, not an isotope geochemist or a geochemist. But uh, chemistry as well could probably help us enormously in understanding the the transit time distribution of our systems. And then how and when are these systems connected? Because it seems, if we've learned anything in catchment hydrology in the last couple of decades, they express these characteristic forms of nonlinearity, thresholds, hysteresis, feedbacks. They're anything but linear. And how can we understand the thresholds for connectedness of different uh, compartments? And I think doing this might help move us you know, in hydrology to a more uh, interdisciplinary study. We even still have boundaries between surface water and groundwater hydrologists, but how maybe this approach could kind of break down barriers with plant physiology or soil science or, or hydrogeology. And uh, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. The uh, compartmentalization problem you're, you're talking about there. Um, it reminds me a lot of sort of the uh, mobile and mobile poor networks we see in unsaturated contaminant transport literature. And I just, I wondered if you had had tested um, that idea in any of, any of your experiments. Yeah, no, I, I not, not really. I'd love to talk to you more about that. Uh-huh. I yeah. mean, I guess uh, some of this is a scaling issue in the sense that if, you know, you take the whole earth as a control volume and you go as deep as Barbara Sherwood Lawler's work does going down to, you know, some kilometers, then at that scale, maybe it's all, it's all connected. And, and perhaps, you know, some of this is a, a control volume question or a scaling question. But I'd, I'd love to hear more about what your thoughts are relative to mobile, immobile uh, pore space in that regard. Yeah, yeah, I think your example with the lysimeter um, really hit on it, where you know you can you can pull up to a certain suction, but then beyond yeah. some point, you're not going to engage those those fine pores, yeah. and yeah. so that mod that water just doesn't move, and if it does, it doesn't move very fast. I um, think I think our big challenge in terms of maybe moving towards what you're saying is um, our extraction techniques are really rudimentary. It's we you know we get either the the mobile stuff at field capacity, if you think of it on a moisture release curve relationship between water content and tension, or we get it all. And what we really want is to be able to sample discreetly along that moisture release curve to get, uh, to be able to match, I guess, the isotope composition of water to its uh, state on that, that curve. And then, I guess, relate the plant water to where it's drawing from on that moisture release curve. Right now, it's kind of all or nothing and we lack the fidelity to try to get at those pieces along the way. Maybe that would be a, a first step towards what you're suggesting, which is a good suggestion. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Anne. Along those lines, I have a question. So, in the same way that water moves through snow, I mean, we used to think snow is a big sponge, right? Yeah. And now we realize it's a sponge that is really dominated by preferential pore patterns. And so our inability to really conceptualize the subsurface mm -hmm. gives, um, and to measure that, those, that characterization, to characterize it, uh, keeps us in this perspective that it's really simple. Like we think of it as a sponge, yeah. right? But yeah. it really isn't. It's yeah. permeability. It's perhaps more about the preferential flow paths that exist yeah. rather than the um, porosity, permeability, like, uh, you know, permeability of the non uh, preferential flow pathway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? And so, yeah. so then that lets, so then it sort of leads to a, w a different way of thinking about the connectivity because, and I, and I think maybe you said this, but like at different, um, 
different amounts of water in, in, these, in the subsurface than uh, as you increase the amount of water that's, in, that's stored, yeah. increases the connectivity, right? So uh -huh. maybe you think of it as like areas that have a higher concentration of, of water and then a preferential flow paths then that fill up and start to connect them. And so yeah. then they can be mobilized, right? Yeah. But I, I, I think that maybe you know, that, that plot that you were showing about, you know, cutting down all the forest and mm -hmm. then in some places it responded and others it didn't. Maybe that is, maybe that's also uh, representing the um, characterization of the, these preferential flow paths mm -hmm. in the subsurface that we, we can't really sense. Yeah. You know? Like yeah, it's yeah. it's tough. I mean, there's many other factors as well, like when did the rain come relative to when the forest was cut down, and uh, I'm not saying it's such a simple story with storage alone, but storage is maybe one missing piece and a dozen factors that seem to relate to that. But maybe also it comes down to the fact that if you're a, a plant rooted in soil and uh, all flow is preferential in the subsurface to some extent, and that's true even on a moisture release curve, you know, you first drain water and you start to pull tension, it's the big pores that drain first and the smallest pores that retain it at the other end of the moisture release curve. And if you're a plant, you probably don't wanna be hanging out your roots in the biggest pores that are draining and are uh, you know, maybe the most dilute uh, chemically. You wanna be in a place that's rich in nutrients. Uh, and you know, the groundwater people have found this. Uh, um, base cation concentration in groundwater is you know, strongly uh, related to contact time and the subsurface. And I think, you know, it relates to the fact that, yeah, it's ev all flow is preferential to some extent, whether it's defined macro pores or just maybe the kinds of mobile, less mobile networks. I talked to people like Dorte Wildenschild, who you know well at Oregon State, and even at the pore scale, they talk about this. And what does it all boil down to? Lattice Boltzmann percolation theory. And they use that as rules to think about how, you know, what the threshold is for water to, you know, move at, the, at that pore scale. So for me, all flow if, is preferential in some way. All flow is very threshold-like. I'm, I'm working on a paper now that is kind of trying to say that um, nothing in rainfall runoff makes sense except in light of storage excess. And for me, a simple maybe analogy is fill and spill. At the pore scale, you need to fill a certain amount to spill, and that could be described by uh, you know, percolation bond number. At the hill slope scale, maybe it's filling up depressions that are isolated on the pockets and at the soil so subsoil interface, and then when you get connectivity, poof, you see some spilling or emergent behavior. And you can see this at catchments, where you've got a lot of headwater catchments. You get a rainfall event. They don't all fill and spill at the same time. It relates to how storage is draped over that uh, landscape. So I think you're, you're on the right track, and I, I agree in principle with what you're saying. I think resolving it down to the preferential flow uh, pathway or description is, is going to be enormously difficult. Uh, we, I'd say I'm as guilty as anyone in hill slope hydrology for having my head up a macropore for probably two decades. Um, but yeah, these are, these are good questions, and I don't have really a good definitive answer for you, just my, uh, my rambling observations. Yeah. 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 I don't know if this is better, but yep, from a water on. balance point of view, the, um, using this, your new equation that you're developing, yeah. the potential, at least, I mean, from a science point of view, it, that's great. From a man water manager's point of view, yeah, you may be including water in there that really is not available. Yeah, and so people will be looking to potentially extract things that really are not uh, viable. Yeah, and so I, I guess it's not really a question, but I don't yeah. know how you would balance between what people might want to use your equation for versus yeah. what you really should be using it for. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm smiling because. Uh, for much of my career, I was in a department of forest engineering at Oregon State University. And um, I had a colleague, who I won't uh, name, who said when, when we published the first kind of two water worlds finding, 
my God, this is great. You mean that if we cut the trees down, they're not related to the stream flow. This is now our legal justification for you know, clear cutting all of Oregon or all of Western Oregon because they're not connected. So yeah, I think you could you know, use, these, uh, use these, some of this science for evil purposes. I don't know. Um, but yeah, your, your point's well taken. Uh, there are, I think, enlightened forestry companies like Arauco in Chile they're embracing this idea that uh, how do we practice forest management in a way that uh, doesn't degrade the hydrology of our landscapes. So their big question is they manage about a million hectares of forest, three quarters of which I think uh, are, are um, radiata pine and one quarter are eucalypt. They'd like to make it a more 50-50 blend. The question is how could they plant more eucalypt and not dry up the streams in the summer because many of these Mapuche First Nations uh, people live in you know, land in a very uh, subsistence-like way. And the way they've, they've done that is to think about storage. How big is the bucket? How, if trees start to draw from that storage in a way that the shallow-rooted radiata weren't, how would that affect low flow? So they're taking a very holistic storage-based view of their operations. To me, that's, that's quite hopeful. And, uh, but yeah, it, it still begs the question about you know, uh, what, uh, what that means volumetrically, I guess, ultimately to what you see in the system. Yeah. Jeff, uh, yeah, Adrian. Great talk. Uh, I'm going to ask, your, your talks always leave me with a lot of thoughts, so this may not be very uh, well said. But I'm left wondering, going back to the moisture release curve, um, and you, you kind of hit on why tree roots wouldn't necessarily want to be in the big pores. But there's reasons they wouldn't want to be in the small pores either, either, which is sort of thermodynamically, it's more energy. It takes more energy, and it's a smaller window that yeah. they can pull water out of the small pores. So what is, why do the trees, I mean, they're, they're playing a balance there, um, I think. Yeah, no, it's a good question, and uh, I'm not a plant physiologist, just like I'm not an isotope hydrologist. I'm not really much of anything <laughs> other, than, other than someone who kind of dabbling on these hill slopes and catchments. I don't know, it, it could boil down to nutrients, and that is where the nutrients are, and I guess, you know, it's probably not just one thing, right? It depends. Trees are so plastic. The, 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 the variation in conditions, you know, you're looking at these Boudicco classes across, you know, wet to dry. You know, the, the balance of factors that go into the decision making in terms of where the tree is getting its water and how it's doing that uh, through other processes like hydraulic lift and redistribution, whether or not it has, you know, symbiotic relationship with mycorrhizal fungi. Yeah, it's complicated. And uh, I think probably what we need to be doing is along, there's, there's no one right approach either, probably. But there's probably room for lab experiments where you can now pare down the range of factors and look in isolation at some of these things to get at maybe those kinds of questions. And this is happening. Habame is one of his PhD chapters was at the rainforest biome at Biosphere 2. Uh, we've just conducted an experiment on some um, uh, 1D or sorry, weighing lysimeters at EPFL in Lausanne with Andrea Ronaldo and Paolo Benetton. And they have willows growing out of the lysimeter. And we can you know, dose the lysimeter with a labeled water and look for it and what leaks out the bottom and what is transpired through the tree. But um, probably it's gonna be a whole range of experiments, but some controlled experiments too to get at what you're suggesting. And maybe one control could be with and without mycorrhizal fungi. Other controls could be other factors to try to, uh, try to isolate some of these things. I, my only comment is it seems it has to be a non-hydrologic control. It's not, if it was just about getting water, they wouldn't yeah. put their roots there. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I'd agree. It's, as it pains me to say, it's not all about hydrology. Uh, I'd, ag I'd agree with that, yeah. And, and nutrients are uh, clearly a, a big one, yeah. 